Uh, hello. Uh, so we are going to continue from uh, where we have left in the values and uh, data types chapter. So we mentioned uh, different uh, types of composition and uh, Cartesian mappings, uh, Cartesian products mapping and disjoint unions. Uh, in disjoint union, uh, the value is coming from either side of the disjoint union operation, either left hand side or right hand side. So today we are going to uh, take advantage of that for uh, defining recursive data structures uh, in a programming language. So we are going to use a special disjoint union to compose uh, such data structures. Uh, uh, so recursive types are data types having uh, themselves appear in the right hand side of their declaration. So S depends on S. So that uh, in order to expand this one, you need this uh, S value, which uh, you need in, in which case you need a termination point most of the time. Actually, you are familiar, already familiar with uh, this type of uh, data structure, which is lists, uh, but mostly linked lists, not Python way of this. Python lists are like uh, arrays. Uh, in functional languages, especially, uh, the lists are more similar to linked lists of data structures you have. But uh, in data structures uh, courses, uh, you have used lots of pointer tricks. Uh, in this uh, case, in the functional language case, we don't need those tricks, thanks to uh, disjoint union operation here. Uh, so a list is either an empty list, so there is a termination point denoting that list is empty, it doesn't contain anything, or it is a Cartesian product of an integer times the remaining list. So list is composed into the first element and the rest, first rest, first rest, and it expands like that until there is no element left. So you will have either empty list or all lists with only one element. So the left hand side of the Cartesian product is X and the rest is empty list. All two element lists, left hand side, is X, right hand side is a list with Y, and the right hand side of the second one is empty. All this of size two, and it goes like that. As you can see, it goes infinitely. Uh, so you can add, expand this as infinitely many times, as long as you have storage, uh, there is no theoretical limit. Of course, we have limits of uh, computational complexity if you have CPU power and so on. But other than that, we don't have any uh, limits in uh, this number of elements. So it is like uh, defining uh, in a data uh, type which has infinitely many values. So if you try to expand the set, we will uh, not reach until the end because it is infinite. Uh, in C, uh, the closest thing is this one. You are familiar from data structure course, but it is uh, actually pointer trick here. So there is a pointer here. So this list does not expand into its own form. In C, if you try to do something like this one, so here, Write a list here, like rest. C will have an important uh, problem. Because C is uh, a programming language uh, allocating storage uh, and uh, for global variables and local variables. And during compile time, it needs the storage size of the variable. And if you define such a uh, variable like e here, what is size of e? Integer, then, and the list, so integer, 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 and there is no termination point here. So the size of this one 
the size of this list tends to infinity. So C is going to reject this. It is going to give you a compilation error. Storage size of struct list cannot be determined, something like that. Any other scenario, if you remember, we have this unsafe unions in C. Uh, so you can have this. Uh, we can have either uh, empty list. You know, so it is going to store some information like empty here or it is going to some a composition a cartesian product of an integer x and list so we have the same issue here so it can be empty or uh, X list, it looks more uh, similar to the Haskell definition, but still we have the same issue because uh, C unions are only uh, relevant uh, uh, with storage. They are not safe. So the storage of this union is like maximum of storage size of int and, uh, sorry, compose in this case and still in order to get compose you will end up in maximum of empty and so on so it's the same story so this is not the actual uh, recursive data type we are looking for but this is the closest thing and with using this pointer trick so the storage size of pointer is well defined so the storage size of this can be determined easily uh, size of pointer plus x and by checking this next value we can determine the termination point and in data structure courses you have examples of that, those however in uh, functional languages you don't have to do that you don't have to have any pointer tricks you can directly do this uh, by using this uh, data type definition. This is how you define a new data type in ASCAD, and it is going to give you uh, the list definition. Uh, so let me just show you how this is possible in ASCAD and demonstrate. So this is our uh, Glasgow ASCAD compiler. Uh, we are going to use this interpreter. There's another famous one, which is Hugs, but uh, JCI is more capable. Uh, it has more features and it is more new. It's uh, updated frequently. Uh, I'm going to use a file. So if you like to do so, you need to set editor first by using this one. By the way, uh, this column start comments are for internal uh, configuration. You can set flags here or you can have uh, some uh, simple uh, settings and some uh, simple operations like rows and definitions, for example. These are all of the definitions in Prudence and so on. Uh, after setting your editor, now you can edit a file in this form. Uh, so it is going to open you the editor, and we are going to start from our data definition, data list is either left of uh, integer and list, or it is empty and deriving show. Uh, so those two magic words I'm not going to explain now. Uh, later you are going to learn about that in the following chapters. Uh, so this is the basic definition of a list. Now we will have some jump in time uh, because of some recording problem. Deriving show is going to show us uh, when we inspected the uh, value. Uh, later, we are going to tell 
what uh, it actually means. So this is the list definition. And once I load this lecture, that program is compiled into uh, memory. So this data type will be available. So when I say empty, for example, it will be available. And if I inspect the data type, you are going to see this list. And if you inspect, for example, uh, left one empty, it is going to be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the prelude is uh, the standard library of uh, Haskell and it is quite comprehensive. So most of the keywords we are using is over there. Instead of left, I am going to use uh, cons so that I don't have to care for that. So this is a list of size one, and you can have criteria values here. So in this way, you can define list of size of your choice. So you can have, for example, cons one, cons two, cons three of, so it is a list of size three. Uh, this list can be uh, expanded in any way you like. Uh, let us write our first function, if you like. For example, what is the uh, length of a list? In uh, Haskell, we uh, write our functions based on patterns. So if the param uh, parameter is empty, the length of the list is zero. So this is simply a pattern in Haskell. And if my parameter is cons of something, it is another pattern. And I can use variables in the pattern. So this is the uh, first element of the list and the remaining list. So now this is my second pattern. Actually, I have two patterns because of this this join union operation. And this is another pattern. Actually, you can add other patterns based on integer values also. But this is the second pattern. So what I'm going to do is, so in this case, I'm going to use recursion. Simply, I'm going to say that if I know the length of remaining list, if I know that, it is plus one. Usually, we like tail recursion. so. We write in this one, okay? One plus, actually it is not tail recursion, but the idea is this is more readable. One plus length of remaining list. So now if you uh, write this new function, the type of this new function will be uh, a list to a number, okay? So if you give this value to len, it is going to give you length of the list. I would like to, uh, get your uh, attention to one important point here. If you write this uh, call in this syntax, you are going to get an error and it looks like frustrating. But the problem here is Haskell uh, has this space between two symbols as a function call. So it is assuming that it is a function call and function calls are left associated. So Haskell is actually assuming this one, and actually this one doesn't make any sense. The right-hand side is not a valid data type, it is Cartesian product of uh, integer and list, and the left-hand side, cons is not a value, so it is going to get this error. Cons is applied to too many arguments and so on. So if you like to solve this problem, actually I did that in the function declaration, you have to surround this value with parentheses so that it is not going to be a problem, okay? So now let us write another function, uh, another important function, recursively. Uh, this is how you handle uh, the recursive data types. You write recursive functions, basically. And it says that uh, if you have a list uh, if you have some empty list, 
concatenated with concatenated with list two, the result is empty list concatenated to a list is the list simply. And I'm going to write another pattern. Actually, it is going to be the same pattern here, so I can copy here. If you concatenate this to list, you can, uh, in, in order to get the concatenation of these two lists, again, you should use this recursive rule. I need to get this concatenation of remaining list and list two. Okay, so this is a function called concat remaining list list two, which returns a new list, and that this will be what that this will be actually if you, for example, concatenating one, two, three with four, five, six, uh, the remaining list will be this one. And first member will be this one, uh, sorry. And this is the list two, okay. So one, two, three with four, five, six is going to be pattern matched like that. So I said that if I know this, two, three, four, five, six, as the concatenation of remaining list and list two. If I know that, what I need to do is I need to compose this remainder with the first element so that I will end up in a new value. And this is basically simple because my data type is a Cartesian product by cons, first member here, and remaining list here. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to construct first members and result of concatenation will be the remainders. Now I define this concat again. Credit is stepping on my feet, so I need to Convert that into LConcat. And if you look into LConcat, it is a function getting a list, another list, and returning a list. And now I can use this. So I can concat this one with empty. So we made a mistake. So let us. So this is correct. So I can say that T is in T T. Okay, well, I made a mistake here in the pattern probably. Also list first remaining list. First remaining list and so on. So you can uh, debug it by using uh, the basics started from basic. So you can, for example, start concatenating empty to this, this and it is going to give you, okay, sorry. We need to use lconcat, okay? Sorry about that. Uh, so this uh, lconcat is getting first list and second list and returning you a new list. Okay? And you can have a concat, and you can use a concat t, a concat, and so on. And you can have other compositions, for example, len and a concat, which is 12. So this is how you deal with uh, the lists. We use uh, recursive functions for handling recursive data types. So returning back uh, to 
uh, slides. Now, we have uh, types of lists. So list is a very basic data structure in uh, programming languages. Some programming languages like Python provided as a replacement for array. So they are randomly accessible. And especially functional languages implement uh, them as uh, linked lists like sequentially accessible uh, lists as we did just a minute ago. Uh, when you talk about this, you have to decide on another choice, which is if your list is polymorphic or uh, monomorphic. So our definition was a monomorphic list. So it was an integer list. However, most of the implementations like concatenation, length of the lists, uh, selecting one basic element out of a list, uh, do not rely on the member's data type. So member data type is a variant here. So we can use, instead of an integer, if we could use the variable name, we can define polymorphic lists. That means list of anything in a single definition. And this is how we do that. So we, we can do this definition. List of alpha is alpha times list of alpha empty. Whatever you substitute in position of alpha is going to give you a list of that. But it is a, a definition of something we call homogeneous list. That means all members will have exactly same data type. So you cannot have, have integer double and so on. So this is how you achieve that in Haskell. Basically, you don't have to use integers here. Your definition can include a type variable. So this is what we call type variable. And instead of integers, I can use that type variable here. And my data type will be list of alpha instead of list. And if you switch back to our definition here, it is something very easy to achieve. I am going to add here A, stands for alpha, A here. And do not forget A here because your data type is list of A. And now, if you look into data type of Alconcat, it is list of A to list of A to list of A. And if you look at the data type of this one, it is list of numbers. Okay. And of course, we have other values are possible. And this is list of fractionals. This is list of booleans. Hello, world. This is a list of, this stands for uh, string for a time being, assume this whole symbol stands for string, but it is actually a character list. Uh, so in this way, I can have this arbitrary uh, list that can be handled. So I can say, for example, let T equals this one in Alconcat T and T. So my Alconcat, works also for uh, string lists and so on. So this is how productive it is. Thanks to this polymorphism, I write once and I use in different data types. But we have a bot and that bot is, what if you have a three here? So you are mixing data types, integers and string, and it is not possible. So we have a problem having this, uh, trying to 
make this string as a number as three is a number and it is not possible. So this is called uh, polymorphism, polymorphism and uh, polymorphic lists. Uh, as I said, it is quite uh, productive. And this is not a member of list of alpha. So we need uh, heterogeneous uh, lists. Uh, for example, in Python, we have uh, the list object is a heterogeneous list, but it is not a recursive definition like that. It is more like to more likely uh, sim more similar to the uh, arrays uh, of uh, C. Okay. And what about Haskell lists? Although I have to make this definition, actually uh, defining concatenation length is boring and you shouldn't be doing that because they are very really trivial. And the answer is uh, no, you don't have to define them because Haskell already did this definition. The product contains this definition along with many uh, helper functions. Uh, also, it is using this convenient uh, infix notation. So instead of list of something, the square bracket of something is used. That means anything you enclose in square bracket will behave like a list. Uh, and instead of this constructor, we are using an infix operator column. Uh, since it is infix, in the left hand side of the Cartesian product is at the left, and right hand side is at the right. And thanks to that, uh, I can make this definition. Instead of empty, I use this close open square brackets, and we end up in quite convenient ways of having lists. You can compose a list like that, or we can use a syntactic sugar like this one so that you don't have to uh, use this uh, less readable syntax. Uh, this stands for this and so on. What does syntactic sugar mean? Syntactic sugar uh, is a process during parsing, you convert all syntactic forms in this uh, format into this format so that programming language actually, the actual interpreter never observes such a syntax. But this never gets into its uh, abstract syntax tree. It directly gets this. During parsing, during interpretation of the line you provide to the programming language, it is converted automatically. And it is what we call syntactic sugar. Uh, so this is uh, the Haskell. This, if you like, you can play with this Haskell as, as well. So I'm going to assume that this definition is already uh, over there. So I'm going to show you how pattern matching works. For example, we have, let us Haskell list concat, empty list, and list two is list two. Haskell list concat. Uh, I'm going to write a pattern here. But that pattern is not going to be a prefix notation like that. But instead, I'm going to use this column. The left hand side will be first, and the right hand side will be remaining list. Okay. And the result will be again a composition left hand side and right hand side. Right hand, right -hand side will be list two, and left hand side will be. Uh, first, you don't need those parentheses, and simply I can use this Haskellis concat. Now I can have Haskellis concat of like that. Okay, uh, I'm not writing the length. Uh, let us write the selector. Uh, the selecting is uh, selecting the uh, and element of the list. So you are going to pick the fifth element and return it. So, uh, for example, uh, one, two, three. If you select fifth element out of this one, it is zero, one, two, three, four, five. Let us pick third element, zero, one, two, three. 32, so it is going to return 32, okay? So select index from the element. So 
question why I'm putting this name, which is not to confuse with others. So my uh, pattern is, uh, if I am out of values, so this, so this is n and list two, if I am out of values, actually this is an error. Uh, there is an error uh, function in Haskell producing this error, so empty list not found. Okay, so this is an error. It is an exception, it will raise this exception. If I have, also you can use numeric patterns in Haskell. So if you are getting zero element out of uh, first and the remaining, the result is the first element because you hit the zero. And if it is n first and remaining, now I'm going to use the power of uh, recursion. So I am going to have uh, Haskell select n minus one on the remainder. Okay, I got rid of the first and now I am going to, so uh, it is not zero, that means it is greater than zero. I'm going to assume that. So I'm going to get rid of the seven and I'm going to search in the remaining list with one less the first parameter. So it is, so let us use select here. Haskell is select fourth element out of this is seven. Third element is 56 and zero element is two and 10th element is empty list not found. So this is how you get the error. Now I would like to show you some shortcuts. The shortcut is this one. In the right hand side, I didn't use M. So I don't, I don't have to name it. I can use underscore to match anything without the name. Okay, so this is like anonymous variable. So this uh, anonymous variables can be used just to make it more readable. Okay, so that declares that wherever match, whatever matches here, I'm not going to use in the right hand side. Same thing here for the first. So this way your code will be much more readable. Uh, also, there is another syntax in Haskell. So let us call it H select. So if you don't like this pattern matching, you can also use uh, this syntax. You can use this one and is less or equal to zero. So it is going to be first. Otherwise, there is a keyword called otherwise. It is eight select n minus one. So this is another uh, syntax you can use, okay? Match based on condition. Th these are also called uh, guard conditions. So this pattern is matched, and if this guard condition matches, it is first, otherwise it is uh, a select. So these are same thing in two different forms. Forget about the warning. I like to use tabs and Haskell guys doesn't, unfortunately. Uh, so this is the uh, operations you can do with Haskell, but the thing is you don't have to, okay? Because we have uh, already implemented functions for these, like plus operator, uh, sorry, plus plus is overloaded for concatenation. Uh, this exclamation mark is overloaded for the selection operation. Uh, take four of two, three, four, whatever it is, as for 
uh, picking first four elements out of the list. Uh, and drop is for dropping four element and you may getting the rest. So in this way, there is a rich uh, set of operations. We have take while, drop while, and so on. So you don't have to define all of those functions on your board. Uh, the next question is actually uh, interesting in the slides. So I would like to show you that question, which is how general recursive types work. So do I have to implement list only or other data types as possible? And the answer is obviously yes. Uh, it is co completely general, so we can add any more uh, information in it, but we have possible restrictions. Haskell is an interesting language, but uh, in other languages, we can have this restriction. For example, this general data type, there is no disjoint union, so we cannot select to terminate the data type. So we have to expand data type as it goes. So it turns out into this uh, C uh, recursive data type problem, okay? You, uh, you cannot uh, determine the size of your data type, the value, the storage requirement of your data type because it is expanding infinitely. Uh, so there is no minimum solution here. So most of the languages do not like this. So they just complain about that and give an error. Uh, in Haskell, it is like that, for example, such a list. What is the result of this list? It is some problem, but Haskell, as I said, is an interesting language. Let x equals cons one cons two of x. I made a recursive definition. And what is x? I'm asking this question. What is x? So it is generating this. So it is printing all those values. So Oscar, instead of comp complaining uh, about this recursive value, it is showing that recursive value. Does it useful? Yes, sometimes. So if you, for example, say select Tenth element of X. So it is I select. No, no, it's not. Let us look into our function. Oh, okay, we didn't uh, write select for Haskell data type. But I can uh, write the Haskell version of that as well. So X is one, two, X, okay. So that's pretty much the same thing. And if you get the answer, it is infinity one, two, one, two. However, if you take first hundred terms out of it, so, Haskell can finish this computation. Okay, I am going to, I am wondering what is the 100,000th value here? Or we can have what is that? So, it's, I believe I pushed it a little bit uh, too much. So, this is too, man, too much recursion for Haskell. Uh, if I have sufficient time, it is going to complete that, but it is something uh, difficult. So, oh, okay, it's like 12 billion, okay. Uh, so it has to generate this 12 billion, expand that and make that, that many uh, recursive calls. So probably uh, that computation is not going to finish. Okay, we had some sort of stack overflow. Uh, so this is and 
let us get small uh, number of recursion and it is going to answer like that. So uh, still computation can be done this infinite uh, value uh, data types, but uh, as I said, only a few languages provide that and it's called lazy evaluation. We are going to talk about that uh, in uh, later chapters. Also another data uh, value, if you like, let y is one y. So I Cartesian products of uh, one and y. Okay, this uh, doesn't, this is an infinite data type, really infinite data type. So it is, uh, there is no data type corresponding to that. Uh, so it is not going to, uh, it cannot generate that, but the infinite values is possible. Um, so now let us go back to slides. So here, the answer of this question is yes. So it should get that, okay. Now, we are going to talk about trees. Uh, tree, actually, uh, I believe you are uh, familiar with uh, trees. Uh, trees provide um, uh, the same uh, recursion, but instead of Cartesian product of some value and uh, recursive value, there are two copies of recursive value in binary trees. And it can go like that. So it is empty, node A, tree A, A, and so on. It will go like that. And uh, again, it is an infinite value data type. It, you can expand this tree infinitely uh, many times. And again, in C, we cannot have. Uh, so this is C with templates so that we can use type variables here. So it will be a generic tree, but still we have this pointer tree, so it is not a perfect uh, recursive tree for us. In Haskell, it is uh, more convenient. We can define it this way, uh, so that tree is either empty or it is coming from a node alpha, tree alpha, and so on. So basically we can write uh, any tree like this. So let us make a couple of uh, three examples in our codes, let's define our tree. So it is either empty tree or it is a node part of A, tree of A and tree of A, driving show to show it. Uh, just to make it interesting, I am going to directly implement a uh, uh, binary search tree for you. So basically inserting uh, empty tree, some value V is basically a node containing V as my value and empty tree and empty tree as left and right child, okay? So this is the uh, basic case we have first insertion into empty tree like that. If I insert into a node pattern, please note that I am using this parentheses. It is important. Otherwise, again, Haskell will try to uh, make it like a function call. A node of, uh, this is a tree nodes, tree value, a left subtree and the right subtree, and I am trying to insert V into this tree. Now I am going to write this uh, empty tree conditions. Uh, so sorry, not empty tree, binary search tree conditions. If T, uh, V is less than TV, I am going to generate a tree with V is inserted to the where to the uh, left subtree. So I'm going to insert left the value V and the right will remain the same, okay? So the left subtree will be substituted by V inserted into the su right subtree. Uh, 
if v is greater than tv, it is going to be not tv left is will be the same and I'm going to insert v to the right. Otherwise they are equal, then actually you can return exactly the same. Okay. So now if I insert empty tree, value tree, it is like that. And if I insert five, it will be like that. And if I It will like that. Okay. So this is how, uh, a simple implementation of binary search tree, uh, like five lines of code. Okay. So it is quite convenient here. Uh, uh, I'm just checking out this syntax if it is going to work. No, it's not working again. I, I'm, I'm using probably the wrong syntax. It should be that. So dollars are used for getting rid of rights uh, associated parentheses. Okay, this is not working as well. Uh, sorry about that. I believe I probably can here. Okay, so uh, so. Um, uh, we will have more examples of that later, okay? Uh, now, going back to trees in Haskell. Now, actually, we have finished about recursive data types. We will have a very uh, special case, which is the strings. Uh, the strings are implemented in different ways uh, in different uh, programming languages. So uh, we mentioned strings at that moment. So strings can be uh, implemented as arrays, like in C, Pascal, and other imperative languages, or uh, as primitive data types. So this is an interesting choice, like ML, Python, and a couple of other languages. Uh, in the primitive data type case, uh, obviously, strings look like non-primitive, uh, value because you can take, for example, fifth character of a string. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean it is decomposable. The programming languages like Python uh, and some of the functional languages uh, provide an internal table. So they keep a hash table of hashable components. Uh, tuples are uh, similar, uh, in, similarly handled in Python, I believe. There is a hash of all string values. So when you refer to a, a string, you are actually referring it as the hash value so that you can pick the hash and use uh, that hash value of the string. So that if you have, for example, uh, thousand variables assigned to the uh, same exact sequence of characters as strings, they do not occupy storage. So we have such uh, ideas. And this is the primitive data type. The second choice is the character array, like it is in Pascal. And the third choice is the list of characters, as it is in Haskell, Prolog, and Lisp. So uh, the Haskell internally converts the string uh, keyword into this square bracket uh, car value. So it is basically a list of cars. So that all uh, list uh, opera operators also works for strings. Okay, so take five of hello world, or you can get this hello world fourth element. So basically, there is no difference between the list implementation and the string implementation. Uh, so this uh, design choice is important uh, when you need operations on lists, for example, concatenation of two lists. 
uh, have some complexity or storage-wise complexity in C, for example, you have to expand the storage. Uh, handling of storage is an issue in C. However, it is not in Haskell. On the other hand, in Haskell, this list-based uh, uh, design choice, there is no random access possible. So you cannot pick fifth element, 10th element uh, directly in constant time. You have to iterate over the list to pick the nth element. Uh, so uh, there are many operations like concatenation, assignment, equality check, lexical order, decompositions. Uh, some of them have equal complexity in all of the languages. Uh, but especially when it needs random access, direct access, uh, this character implementation will work faster. However, as I said, uh, handling the storage is a problem in the character array. Uh, case. So now, at this moment, we are going to uh, talk about uh, type systems. So now uh, we are going to talk about um, how types are handled. So, so far we have finished what data type is, what values are possible, what types of compositions are there, and the recursive compositions, composite data types. Uh, and now we are going to talk about uh, what does uh, type mean for the programming language. First, storage, we already mentioned that, how much uh, space on hard disk or not hard disk, but memory, uh, the value uh, is going to occupy. The second thing is about integrity, okay? Our operations are carried out based on one basic assumption. At that area of storage, in this area of memory, there is an integer. And now I am trying to add them. So that assumption, this is an integer and this is an integer. As the CPU, I know how to add them because they are integers. If one of them double one of integers, it doesn't fit because CPU cannot handle that. So I should, as the programming language, I should convert that integer into double so that CPU can handle the operation. And for all, all types of operation, we have that. So I have to make sure uh, that uh, when the operation is to be executed by CPU, the data types are compatible, okay? Uh, so this, uh, most of the tasks, or not most, but a significant amount of the task a programming language does in the program before giving it to the CPU is handle all of these type situations. Some of the situations are uh, recoverable, and we can have uh, the uh, type conversion possible amount of types. So programming language converts them. And some of them are not recoverable. So programming language simply just raise an error during compilation or if it's an interpreter at the runtime. So now we are going to uh, talk about that, uh, how to make this uh, type checks. Uh, thanks to this, first, the operations will be possible. The second is, most of the type incompatibilities come uh, from the user errors. So user by mistake writes different value, uh, do not use the correct value, do not declare in the uh, correct way, so that this, these are actually bugs, programming mistakes. The programmer is not aware of what he or she is doing. So we can avoid that if you, if you do this type checking. Uh, so such irrelevant operations can be avoided this way, okay? So you cannot select member of a value, uh, primitive value, you cannot multiply Boolean with 12. In C you can do, but it is actually, uh, doesn't make any sense. So you cannot take the first element of 12 or uh, a member of X and so on. Now, we have to do type checking and conversion if necessary. Uh, but the question is when to do that? The point of type checking, you can, uh, a point of type checking in time, uh, what, which is the correct place? Uh, 
uh, actually, I can tell you for sure uh, how far you can delay it. Okay, you can delay it until doing the operation. Okay, after doing the operation, it doesn't make any sense. But before the operation, uh, it is the last resort of make, making sure the data types are the same. So you have to do that just before the operation, the latest. But we have another option, which is compile time. So we can do that at compile time and make sure that in advance, the data types are compatible. So our binary contains all uh, compatible values during the compilation. And second thing is the runtime. We start our program, program goes, works like a couple of days. And after a couple of days, some two values are incompatible. Just before doing the operation, ah, okay, they are not compatible. And we raise a runtime error. Uh, the first type, uh, you all know from uh, C, we have this uh, compile time type checking or static type checking. Uh, and in Python, we make dynamic type checking. So your program works in Python, and then it gets a, a type compatibility uh, error, type error, and so on. Uh, in uh, Python, we have value errors and type errors, uh, depending on how you uh, do that. Python will do its best to uh, go over the errors, so that there is no, for example, variables can change data types, etc. But uh, it has to give error if it is not recoverable. So uh, how static type checking work? First of all, uh, static type checking should rely on the syntax. Okay, You have to provide clues about the data types in the syntax so that uh, the syntax is going to decide on type compatibility uh, issues. Uh, in C, for example, you have to declare everything. Okay? So this is a variable, this is an integer, this is a, a double, this is a float, etc. in advance, and then type compatibility relies on that uh, declaration information. In Haskell, uh, you can do that, but you don't have to. Haskell will infer data types. Okay, from the syntax, it will say that, oh, okay, this should be integer, this should be number, this uh, is in the left-hand side of the uh, plus plus operator, so it should be a list and so on. So it will try to match data types. But uh, the idea is they both use static type checking. Okay? So before compilation, it has to resolve all of the type problems. Uh, and this comes with another uh, issue. The variables have constant type, okay? The variables do not change their data types, okay? It starts as an integer, then it becomes a floating point, then boolean, then a pointer. This is not possible in static type checking languages. During its lifetime, I'm talking about lifetime uh, in terms of if it can be a parameter, it can be a, a function, uh, local variable and so on. During that, it is uh, fixed. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, static type checking requires everything is uh, declared by the user or inferred by the programming language. Uh, so the user has to declare all of them, like C, C++, Fortran, and some languages infer data type. It has one major advantage. Uh, when you compile it, that binary doesn't carry any runtime type of information, or it doesn't have to carry any runtime information. That means it is plain, fast and efficient binary without making any other operation than actual operation. No type checking, problem left, because compiler resolved everything, and put a binary making blindly having all of the operations. Okay. Uh, in the dynamic type checking, we delay that. And that delay 
has one basic purpose, the flexibility. So that if you delay that, you can adapt it based on the runtime information so that the variables can change their data types and they can uh, adapt. So your functions can uh, operate on different data types based on the runtime properties and so on. Uh, mostly we have some uh, functional languages like this prolog and uh, mostly the in uh, interpreted script languages like PHP, Perl, Python, uh, JavaScript, and so on, uh, apply dynamic type checking. So this is a simple example of that. Uh, this is a Python example. Given the input, I don't know what input is yet. When this function is compiled, the Python doesn't know about what is going to be input. So that Python can ask this question. Is it integer? Is it string? Is it something else? At runtime, it can ask this question. And based on the answer, it can get some actions. And this is actually advantage of dynamic type checking. Your uh, functions is not functions are not limited with data types during compilation. It, they can be flexible. So if Boolean comes, work this way. If integer comes, works the other way. So this is possible. Uh, also, we have uh, some uh, way of operating on different data types. So this is a Python 2 example based on user inputs. It can be integer or it can be a string or another value. This function will operate in different ways. Uh, but we have one major disadvantage, which is you have to carry this information. OK, I'm going to operate on x. And what is the type of x? I have to carry that information. So that in Python, for example, you can ask that in runtime. What is the data type? Is it instance, the type of x? You can ask those questions. But it has a cost, a storage cost. Every value is labeled with some data type. All variables contain its content and data type. Type of a variable uh, can change at runtime. This is an advantage. Okay, so you can switch that. Uh, but uh, most programming languages choose static type checking because of a couple of important reasons. One is the speed. It is faster, obviously. So there is no runtime type checking. We don't have uh, any CPU power used against uh, this type checking. Uh, the second thing is it is restrictive. Okay, so you, you you your function can operate on integers, okay? integer only. So you cannot if it is integer works this way and so on. Uh, this is both an advantage and disadvantage. It's an advantage because you can write flexible code works that way or another way based on runtime data. Also, it is a disadvantage because. People make, make mistakes. People make typos, typing errors, invalid data types. I shouldn't call that function with a string, but I call it that way. People do that. And they do that a lot. And uh, if your programming language does static type checking, you will understand your error. You will get your mistake at the compilation time as early as possible because it's a mistake. In a dynamic type checking language, your program will work, work for hours, work for days, and after a couple of days, you will get an exception. Uh, that's why uh, some of the programming languages uh, provide alternatives like JavaScript versus TypeScript. TypeScript is the type version of JavaScript so that uh, when program is uh, loaded, it makes this uh, user supplied uh, type checking at uh, compilation time. So that makes sure that uh, the JavaScript code is uh, valid. So there is no uh, typing mistakes and so on. Uh, the same as uh, same in Python, uh, there is a Python dialect 
having a like a preprocessor, you provide that it process your uh, Python code, annotated Python code. You said that X is an integer and so on while, by def while defining your functions. And it is going to complain about the typing errors you make. It. So this is like static type checkers in front of the uh, dynamic type checking languages. So it is becoming popular. Just because of this problem, people make mistakes. And it's hard to, under, uh, the programming language cannot understand if it's a mistake or it's a feature. Uh, the next problem we have is the type equality. How are we going to decide on two types are equal? So uh, again, uh, there are two options here, uh, making that uh, based on some uh, mathematical recursive definition versus making in a very simple way. Okay, so name equals is the simple way. The data type should be defined exactly at the same position, same place. So type declaration, built-in data type or user subtype data type is declared once. And that declaration, those values, that compatibility uh, checking values should refer to exactly same data type. Uh, even though the data types looks like each other, you say that they are not equal and it's called name equals. The second one is structural equals. It is about com uh, compatibility. Uh, if you remember our math-based set of data types, that set should be equal, not uh, the type declaration, but set should be equal. Again, uh, we have programming languages has one tendency uh, choosing name equals because this is easier to implement and Obviously, the other one is not worth implementing. Uh, so this is uh, my example here. Here we have uh, this uh, declaration here, which defines two things, struct comp and complex. By uh, thanks to this type def, they are uh, declared to be the same. Okay, complex is struct comp. Struct comp is complex. It is just an alias to existing data type. So this complex is defined here, and this is the only position of its definition. Uh, the second data type is capital comp. It is declared here. Now I have two values, A, B, C. And if you run this program with uh, C compiler, you will see that uh, even though the field names are the same and the doubles are the same. This one is valid, this one is not. Because A is defined here, which refers to this declaration. B is declared here, which refers to same declaration. So B and A are the same. But if you look into C, C is defined, declared here, which refers to this line. So it says that it is one versus one, and this says it is one versus two. So it should exactly come from the same points, okay? So this is the idea. So uh, this is easy to implement because the programming language keeps track of which data type is defined where. So basically it is going to just use that information to make the type checking. The alternative, which is structural equality is much more difficult to implement because it's a recursive definition. So uh, if you have two primitive data types, they should be the same. So they shouldn't be different. Then for Cartesian products, we have uh, to implement this one-to-one uh, -one mapping should be equal. Okay? For disjoint union of two data types, either this way or this way. So uh, it is uh, order free. Okay, so you can switch the orders and then uh make the make the comparison 
in a uh, real programming language, we have tags here, and they, those tags should have some uh, importance, of course. But mathematically speaking, we need to take this. We need to respect that order is uh, changeable. Okay. So we have either of this one or the other one is true. The mapping is again one to one. And the power set is the same. Otherwise, I am going to make this. So uh, if you have a data type, like this, you can think about how hard the implement the structural equality. You need to have some recursive comparison functions and recursively you check for all data types one against each other. Uh, now I'm going to show you a much more difficult situation where we have the recursive cases. If there is no recursion, it is still manageable or it is tractable. So, however, if we have recursion like that, how I am going to decide on the equality? Now, your uh, recursive function to implement structural equality is infinitely recursive. So, you have to have some trick in order to solve that. Trick is basically having this uh, cyclic dependency. Okay. Uh, so we have t here, which is integer times t itself or nil. And the other one is the same. Like that. Okay. So, so in during equality, you can have uh, instead of making this uh, revisit again and again, you can check that if t is equal t, then t is equal t prime. You can assume that, and you can go out of this recursion by using this. But life is not that always easy. What about This second one, okay. Now, t is integer times t itself, or we have nil, but we don't have this. We instead we have types referring to each other. And Haskell, for example, you can uh, refer to other data types in the body of data type declaration. So it goes to t and it is integer times yeah nil here and it goes like that. So you go over cycles. And if you have some cycle detection algorithm, you can resolve such uh, equations and so on. However, still we have that uh, major problem. Is it complex? And the next thing is does it worth it okay. does implementing such a complex algorithm uh, make sense or is it useful for example a square is double x y a so this is what this is this stands for radius a square is a which is the size of the square okay one dimension of the square the other dimension is the same are they compatible structurally? Yes. They should be compatible. Should they be compatible? No, because this one is circle, the other is square. And you, I can come up with many other examples. In real life, sometimes, for example, three as the day of week versus three as the day of the month, are they equal? Should they be compared? Should they be put into something as equal values? No. So the semantic 
behind the data type is also important. And this uh, structural equivalence doesn't respect that. It ignores the semantics of the data type. And that's why, which is not popular, hard to implement and it doesn't respect the semantics. So uh, only way you need such a data type is actually you are working on some math equations, some uh, proof-based uh, symbolic calculations and so on. For that, it is useful. But other than that, again, people make mistakes and you don't like those mistakes like uh, adding day of the month to adding day of the week to be significant. On the contrary, uh, some programming languages like Ada, for example, uh, people write their own uh, integer data types. So this is my integer for day of the week, and this is my integer for day of the month. And if you try to add them up, the programming language comp uh, complains. Okay. This is a feature. So restricting the programming programmer and uh, giving many uh, compiled uh, time uh, errors to the programmer is a feature provided by some of the programming languages. That's why, for example, Ada is popular in defense industry, where programming security is uh, very important. So this is the example in the slide, same with that. Okay, now we are going to talk a little bit about the type completeness. Uh, actually, the purpose of this slide is to give you a uh, definition of first order values. First order values can be assigned, put as a function parameter, take part in composition and return value from the function. If your data type cannot be uh, used for any of this, it is not first order, it is a second order value. Uh, in most imperative languages, uh, for example, functions are second order value, like Pascal and Fortran, for example. And C, we have a trick, pointer trick. We use function pointers as, so pointers are first order. Functions uh, substitute as their pointers and they can be used by the pointers. So it is something gray, actually. Uh, so this distinction is important because we can operate on functions, for example. We can pass functions as parameters. We can return functions as return value. This is something uh, powerful mechanism. Uh, in most of the function languages, there is no uh, order difference. Everything is first order. Sometimes even the uh, data types are first order values. Sometimes data types are not first order, so they, can be, they cannot be treated as values. Uh, we have, uh, again, gray uh, values like arrays and structures. In Pascal, it is called records. Uh, the arrays and structures are in the gray because we have uh, issues about using them, for example, passing as a function parameter or returning as a value. And you know from C, we have issues like that. So now let's talk about this table. Then I'm going to give you take uh, type, com uh, type completeness principle. So this is a table I filled with uh, the data types of C, primitive data types, arrays, structures, and functions. And the operations are here. So as you can see in C, the functions cannot be assigned as a whole. I mean not the pointers. The pointers are primitive. Uh, they cannot be function parameters, function return, and so on. However, structure can, structure, structures can be assigned, function parameters return as a value and take part in composition. No problem here, primitives. For arrays, assignment is not possible. Function parameters is not possible. I'm not talking about pass by pointer. I'm talking about passing whole array as a value to be copied. Function return, no, but they can take part in composition. So this is some place we have 
uh, violating this uh, type competence principle. So anything arbitrary here is some violation of type completeness principle. So it says that uh, if a value is first order, order, it should take part in all of the uh, operations here in this list. There should be no arbitrary restriction. So value shouldn't be in this gray area. Sometimes first order, sometimes not. And Haskell, we don't have any issue with that. There is no arrays, but uh, lists cannot can take part in any, anywhere. In Pascal, we have two violations because in Pascal we have arrays can be assigned and passed as a function as a value. Uh, but you cannot return it and start, you cannot return structure. So Pascal guys has an issue with returning large uh, values. So that's why they have this. And uh, and in C, for example, I, in order to show you uh, how this is an issue, I can give you an example. So in C, you can do this. And then you can write a function that gets a C value and returns a C value. And then we can call here with FC. So this is a trick that some of the C programmers use. You cannot pass an array as a value. However, you can use this trick by enclosing in uh, encapsulating uh, array in a structure so that you can use it as a function return, function parameter. Uh, even you can do, can I do, okay, I cannot edit this. So even you can do this, for example, A, B, and you can, so you cannot uh, assign underlying arrays, but you can use structures to violate whatever is happening within the language. And this is what uh, in the Watts book, the our uh, textbook, uh, what they call the type uh, completeness principle. Your type are not complete; they are in, not intuitive. So users say that, oh, if I can assign large structures. I should be assigning large arrays as well. Why not? And this violates that in C. In Pascal, same way. Okay, I can return, I can do assignment, function parameter, I can do anything, but cannot return. Okay. So this is uh, a quality measure that a programming language should follow. There are, of course, reasons behind that, but if the programming language designers be careful about that, the programs will be more comfortable. Uh, now at this moment, I'm going to give you examples about the expressions because expressions are uh, programming language phrases that uh, are evaluated into some value, okay? Uh, so I'm going to uh, skip some trivial uh, expressions and going to give you interesting uh, ones. Uh, so there are literals, variable constant access, aggregates, variable references, function calls, and conditional expressions, and iterative expressions. Uh, literals are uh, programming language constants, so you can directly use them okay, in your code. And they uh, end up in some primitive value. So this is important. So these are literals of uh, C, and in Python we have the same similar set. In Python, we have an additional complex data type. Uh, also in newer standards of C, there is the complex data type. So we can have literals of complex uh, as well. Uh, 
The next thing is about the variable and constant access. So if you define a variable and if you use that variable, it refers to that variable. So it is also an expression. Uh, in this case, R is a variable, I believe. And this is the constant. Constant uh, do not change and they are similar. Uh, so when we use the variable, we usually at the right hand side, we uh, mean the value of the variable. So it is an expression again. The second thing is the aggregates. The aggregates uh, are like literals, but they return composite values. So in the uh, programming language code, you compose uh, composite values uh, on the fly, uh, like tuples of Haskell, uh, the records of Haskell. The records are uh, uh, defined uh, in a different way in Haskell. Actually, we need a tag here. We are missing in the slides a tag here. So let me try to give you an example of that. Uh, so, so data person is like person of name i'm not sure about the syntax so please forgive me if i get an error here and uh, so it is and let us have the id as integer It is going to compile. Yes, it's compiled. Okay. So now looking at our data type, I have this field based access. So now I can say this, for example, that x is person of name equals honor surname equals and students equals false and id equals this one. Oh, sorry. Again, privilege is stepping. On our feet. So now it is a record and record is similar to tuple, but the uh, major advantages you can have this uh, pattern based match contains the names. Also, uh, the Haskell will provide you, for example, what is name of X, what is surname of X. So, these functions are provided for convenience like that. Uh, so, this is like name based accessible tuples. Okay. So Similar to that. Uh, the second aggregates, interesting aggregate we have is the lambda. So given x, x plus one is a function actually. So this aggregate creates a function here on the fly without declaring, and I can use it. Okay. Uh, so instead of so instead of f x y equals x times y. You can define it in this way that g is lambda x lambda y. So it's slash is read as lambda x times y. So that is the same function. But uh, instead of declaring as a function, it can be created on the fly, on demand. Uh, the same thing exists in uh, Python as lambda. So you can say f is lambda x, lambda y, and it returns x times y. So type of f will be uh, I search language. Forgot that sometimes. So it's a function. So that you can have f. Which is invalid syntax because, because Python expects 
to have parentheses. So, uh, but this is not going to work, okay? So we are going to revisit that later. Uh, but the idea is if you like so, you can create this function instead of that in the syntax. It gets a Cartesian product. Uh, okay, it is not possible in uh, Python. Um, if you like to define that this way, this is the way you like. So this is lambda returning a function aggregate. Okay. Uh, uh, Besides that, we have dictionaries and lists in Python. Also, set is possible as an aggregate. Uh, in Haskell, you can have any uh, any of your data type tags like we used in the tree, empty tree, uh, node, or blah, blah. They are also uh, aggregate constructors, user-defined aggregate constructors. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, what about uh, the C? Uh, RCC has uh, aggregates only in definition, so you can use this syntax, okay? The person P origin, you can define that uh, in the declaration or the arrays can be defined this way, but this is obviously an error in RCC. However, thanks to uh, newer standards in C99, for example, they came up with this syntax, okay? Uh, this syntax works for arrays, so there is no problem. And if you put this uh, type conversion, uh, you can use arbitrary structures, compose aggregates on the fly, and assign them or pass as a value to parameters and so on. Uh, in C, even they introduced this uh, function aggregates. Uh, I believe they call it anonymous functions, but the idea is the same. So assume you have the sort function having this requirement for a function pointers. This syntax here will create a function on the fly and put the pointer here so that sort function can use. Okay. You can try uh, with your own examples uh, on your own. Uh, also, there are some capturing uh, definitions here, which makes it more complicated because we have some lifetime issues here, but forgetting about that, it gives you some basic uh, flexibility so that you can declare something in, uh, without uh, declaring a function. Okay. This is quite a convenient use because sort requires a comparison function. I supply it on the fly without declaring somewhere else and referring it here. Uh, the uh, languages like JavaScript uh, use it a lot. So the JavaScript uh, is a callback based language and most of the callbacks are created on the fly like that. Uh, in JavaScript, we have this syntax, for example. Uh, for example, a function can have a parameter f, another callback function. gets a value a and after doing something returns some value okay so this is a typical case in most of the javascript applications uh, in later implementations they have uh, this shorthand syntax for declaring functions so it is you don't have to, uh, sorry there is no cd here sorry about that okay so they use this uh, more easy to read, easier to read syntax, okay. So it's, they, this is math notation. Uh, and this is, again, uh, aggregate here in JavaScript. Okay, uh, now, uh, one major difference is about uh, variables, variables value versus variables storage or variables uh, L value versus variables R value. Uh, you know uh, the difference, uh, but uh, this is sometimes significant in programming languages. Uh, 
In C, they have some choice using pointers. So pointer will be something different than the variable itself. So they make this restriction left hand side versus L value versus R value. Uh, and the pointer is something you use to relate uh, the variables reference in a uh, hacky way, okay? Uh, so the uh, the pointers are not references. So sometimes uh, we pass reference of a variable to a function, for example. This is possible. Uh, some languages, uh, the references are like first order values, like in Java, Python, uh, all variables uh, of composite objects uh, mean their uh, L values, actually, the references, actually. So you pass them uh, by reference. You can pass them by reference. In C++, it is partially, we have that. You cannot assign uh, references, but you can pass them as uh, reference and so on. Uh, some languages make this distinction, and this is something interesting. It is not common, but uh, actually, actually your uh, daily usage, uh, we have a programming language called Bash, actually. It is the shell. Shell is nothing but a programming language. It has values, even arrays, associated arrays, and so on. Uh, but the thing is, when you make an assignment like that, if you echo A, you will get A, because any string in bash is in its literal form. If you use it in the left side, left hand side of the assignment, it will work as a variable, but otherwise it is a string. So if you like to refer to the variable reference, you put a dollar here so that it is going to use the variable, this variable A instead of string A. So this is an interesting example, uh, making the difference between the L value and R value in the syntax. So you are not using the same string, dollar A versus A. This is sometimes used. Uh, actually, this part is uh, something you already know. The function calls are actually expressions. Instead of uh, evaluating expression uh, in line, uh, then function declaration is called, it is executed, and whatever it returns is substituted in the location. We have parameters, and operators are nothing but uh, built in uh, functions by the programming language in the infix notation. So they are, uh, instead of programming language defining this way, it is defined this way. Uh, and some languages provide uh, building mechanisms. Sometimes yeah, you have operator overloading, so users can define their own operators. So they are, instead of uh, writing functions, users are, are able to write uh, their operators as well. Uh, for example, C++ and Haskell like that. In C++, you can overload existing operators. In Haskell, you can overload uh, non-existing operators. Uh, so next thing is the conditional expression. Uh, in Haskell, conditional expression is in this form. If condition is true, the value of the total expression will be xp1. Otherwise, it is xp2. Uh, and the second one is the case. We are going to have examples of that later. Uh, the difference is the case is based on pattern match. So value is matched against p1. P2 and so on. And, uh, and if this should be a Boolean, there should be a Boolean operator. In this one, we don't need Boolean, we use pattern match. So let me show you a simple example. Actually, I'm going to show you okay, our, this example. So let us make it not much difficult, but okay. I am going to take this as my victim. Uh, and write, rewrite it as HH con HF concat instead A and B. Then I am going to do this case A of then I am going to use the pattern match. If it is matches, 
empty list, I'm going to return B. If it matches first and remaining list, I'm going to return first and, by the way, I wrote this wrong. It should be a chat on okay. HL con of so A and HL con of rem and B. So what happened? I write a conditional expression. If A matches empty list, the expression value will be B. If it matches this one, expression value will be this one. So I can also define my function this way. Okay, I have an error here. Ah, sorry, HMS. I need this to this too. Okay, so. We have had some error, but the, I, I believe you got the idea. Ah, so the key. This should be first. Okay. Uh, so this is the conditions of uh, Haskell. What about C? You all know this, our ternary operator. Also, this is possible. So it returns function pointers of C versus function pointer, of course. This expression returns a function pointer. And if you apply X to that, you will get it. And Python, uh, we have slightly strange syntax. It is like infix uh, ternary operator. Condition is in the middle, true and false. This is like that. It is going to return expression one if condition is true, otherwise it is expression two. Uh, so you have to make sure you understand the difference between a conditional expression and a conditional statement. See if then else is, not then if else is conditional statement. This one is conditional expression. Because obvious reason, this one doesn't have a value. And if some uh, programming phrase doesn't have a value, we don't call it an expression. We call it a statement. So in this chapter, we are interested in the values. So we are interested in the expressions only. So this is Haskell example of the conditionals here. Uh, this is the pattern match. For example, user supplied data types like that is more suitable for pattern match because comparison operator is not defined by default. Uh, this is how you match the tree and so on. Uh, so that's why case is more productive. So case uh, is more suitable for anything because it doesn't like, it doesn't need, for example, comparison operator. Uh, iterative expressions, uh, they generate lists. So basically it is the mathematical description here in this syntax instead. And it is quite productive in Haskell and it replaces many higher order functions. So we can say, for example, uh, A will be such that A is coming from one, two, three, and B is coming from A, B, C. So you will have Cartesian product of A and Bs in this way. Or you can have this arbitrary numbers. And you can also use filters if A is less than B.
uh, not if there is no if else you have to use so this is the condition so you are going to get only the cartesian product where a is less than or equal to b so if you look into this tuples first one has to be less or equal to the second one and this is the reverse okay uh, so you can have uh, different versions you can come up with for example you can use any expression here i'm using python syntax sorry about that So this is the idea. Uh, the same thing exists in Python in a very similar syntax, but only difference is we have iterators and you have to repeat this for it's like that. Uh, also, you can have if A is less than B, so you can have this as well. And compositions or aggregates here, like it is in Haskell, is also possible uh, in Fortran as well. So it, it is called iterative expressions. It's quite productive and useful if you need values in the fly practically. Um, so the last thing is very special case, which is called block expressions. The idea is uh, you have multiple statements and those statements have some useful task doing, uh, task uh, calculated in some local scope. Uh, but you like that group of statements to have a value. Actually, statements doesn't have a value. So this is a GCC extension. It is not in RCC. It is not in some C90 standard. They put a block here in parentheses. So the value of this parentheses will be the last expression, the last statement's value. And this way, for example, I can define uh, in local uh, scope, I have some algorithm. That algorithm computes something, something in a loop, etc., and the result is substituted here, which is sometimes useful. Some programming languages have that, uh, like ML has such a feature. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, JavaScript, but I believe they have something. The last statement has some meaning. Uh, so the computation of an expression can be can consist of multiple statements and sometimes you use that for example logging purposes so for example if you like x is equal to printf y printf uh, j was Here, so I call printf on that and C. So instead of uh, writing versus x is C plus one, okay. So for debugging purpose, I make sure that before uh, having this computation, having this calculation of expression, it will write previous value of C or whatever value C has. Okay, so there might be such usages. Um, sorry. Now, as a summary, we have in this chapter, actually, it is a crowded chapter. Uh, we have value and type definitions of that, 
primitive composition, uh, types of composition, list entries and other recursive data types. When do we do type checking, static versus dynamic type checking and name equals versus structural equals for type checking and the expressions. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, uh, our next chapter is about storage and see you later. Bye-bye.